Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> uh, well, welcome everyone. And uh, I'm, uh, if, for those of you that don't know me or recognize me, because now I have hair on my face, uh, I'm Doug Meyer. I'm one of the elders here. And if you're joining us online, uh, we welcome you. Uh, Nancy and I have been away in uh, Texas for uh, last week was our first week back. And uh, I can tell you it is a whole lot better to be here seeing all your smi <laughs> smiling faces and, uh, and being here in person than it is watching you online. And uh, so that's just an encouragement if you're joining us online that uh, it is way better to be here if it's possible for you to come. So, um, but uh, last week, uh, Gordon and Sharon were here and uh, they were giving us a little, uh, uh, well, Gordon gave us a message, but um, just a general thing on uh, their mission and what's happening in South Sudan. And some of the things that kind of struck me about that was that uh, they were talking about all of the lawlessness, rebel warfare, um, and, uh, you know, murder, mayhem, just lawlessness, all kinds of horrible things. And I know that there's things like that going on all over the world where there's poverty and um, just war and all kinds of different things like that. And, um, but one of the things that Gord said that kind of struck me is that he said, but the word of God goes on. You know, churches are being planted and people are coming to the Lord. And, um, and so, you know, regardless, um, if I can call it North American problems, regardless of what we are going through, regardless of what's happening in your own life, or you personally, your inner turmoil, whatever it might be, um, you know, anything like that should not be uh, any kind of excuse or hindrance for keeping us uh, apart from him. Um, we're to be drawn to him. And that's kind of where I'm gonna go with, with uh, today's message. But before I get into that, um, I just wanna open in a, in a prayer. So, Lord, I just pray Lord, especially that uh, any words that I would have this morning would be pleasing to you and that they would be your words. And that, um, Lord, any, um, anything that you don't want me to say, that you would just strike it out of my um, thoughts. And, uh, and Lord, mostly I just pray for each person here that you would um, just quiet our spirit, Lord, that you would find the evil one, that he wouldn't cause any distraction, but just that we would be able to slow ourselves down and that we would just be able to focus on you and nothing but you. And Lord, um, I know that each person here is coming from a different place in their life. Some people may be here searching for you and other people may have known you for years and, and all different circumstances, all kinds of different uh, things that are happening in our lives, Lord. I just pray that you would remove that and just allow you to speak to our hearts in a way that you would have for each one of us individually. And only you can do that. And so we just uh, surrender this time to you now that uh, you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Um, I'm going to start um, with uh, Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3. It'll be on the screen. Or you can follow along if your Bible, if, if you are. Um, going to be following your Bible um, after it goes on the screen later on in the message. It's going to I'm going to go back to it. So if you want to leave a marker or whatever, um, feel free to do that or your tablet, whatever you're going to use. But, you know, before I before I uh, came up here, even this morning at home, I was praying that uh, the Lord would uh, just use me and um, that and that he would calm my nerves and everything else and I feel a little bit shaky up here and uh, and so I just prayed that you know he would use me in however he wants and apparently he's he wants me to be a little bit nervous so uh, <laughs> so I however he wants to use me he can use me right so anyway so but uh, I'll read here therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, 
he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And so, like I said before, the, the thing about this race that's marked out before us is that it's going to be different for each of us. But regardless of what happens in our life, um, it, it's, it's all been marked out by God. And uh, so this whole race that's before us, the race is basically your lifelong, um, your lifelong thing. Your life, like it's, it's everything. And your race is not a, um, a physical race, but it's a race of your life that you're to become more godly. It's, it's a race toward God through your life. And so I don't want you to be confused that I am talking about earning your salvation, not at all. Um, but what I'm talking about is for those of us who believe and are already saved, it's your race toward holiness and, and that kind of uh, uh, a thing where you, you, you want to become more like Christ as your life develops. Hopefully, you know, 10 years ago, you weren't the same person as that you are today, that kind of thing. And um, so, you know, there's a lot of things in your life that you might not understand. Why is this happening to me? Um, I don't understand why I'm under these certain circumstances, whatever that might be. Maybe you're looking for a job or you're looking for a spouse or you're not looking for a spouse or <laughs> um, whatever it might be or all these unanswered questions that might be in your mind. Um, and, uh, you know, and you pray for certain things and, and maybe you feel like they're not happening. And a lot of times, you know, as we go through life, when you get old like me, you know, and you look back, or like Jim, uh, but you look back on your life and you, um, uh, you know, sometimes you think, well, you know, I'm glad that that prayer didn't come true kind of thing. And there's even a country song that talks about that he thanks God for unanswered prayer where, you know, all of a sudden he realizes later in his life that, you know, I'm glad this or that didn't happen. And uh, so, um, but anyway, the whole thing is that designed to form you in the person that God wants you to be. Um, in his wisdom, he puts different challenges in front of us, different things, circumstances that happen in our life. And those are the things that build our character and help us to become uh, the way that we are. Um, so what I want to talk about a little bit is this race, this lifelong thing. When I was preparing this message, um, all, all the commentators were emphasizing that this is a race of, um, uh, uh, what's the word again? Uh, long-term <laughs> marathon. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a race of a marathon, like such a long-term thing. And um, so I want to emphasize that when you're in a race, you don't kind of just muddle through a race. A race is something that you prepare for, and it's something that you train for, and it's something that you want to go at with a sense of wanting to be victorious. You want to uh, approach it with a sense of urgency or determination. Um, you know, it, when I was a little boy, I remember uh, uh, whatever it was called, a fable or whatever, about the tortoise and the hare you were in a race. Um, a lot of you probably are way too young to ever hear, hear this story, but uh, anyway, the tortoise ends up winning the race because the rabbit is too busy uh, thinking that he's got this whole race wrapped up, and so he doesn't really have to hurt, work that hard. He's just back there eating carrots and stuff like that, and the turtle's just do, 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 you know going along, and, but he wins the race because he keeps at it all the time, and um, so that's kind of like the, the thing that when it comes to having that um, endurance race, I don't want us to think, think that, you know, I've got my whole life to work toward these things because you could be like the rabbit. You know, it's, it's like I, do, I don't want us to fall into a, a, 
an attitude of complacency. Uh, a long time ago, I heard a little story of how, uh, actually almost a lifetime ago, where if you picture that your life is only one inch long, I don't care if your life is 20 years or if it's 100 years, but that's your life, that one inch on a ruler. And then, okay, so what would eternity be like compared to that one inch? Like, would it be a foot or like maybe a yard or a mile? See, we can't even fathom what eternity even is. And so when you're thinking about a race and you're thinking about um, this endurance race that's ahead of us, you know, no matter how much of an endurance you think you need to run a whole life, compared to eternity, it's really not much. And I think that if we approach that uh, pursuit of God in a um, more of a determined fashion, uh, you know, we'd, we'd be a lot better off. Um, our life is not designed to merely be endured. Uh, that's, that's not abundant living. That's not very exciting. It's actually very unexciting. Um, so, you know, my point is just, we shouldn't just sit by and see what happens. Um, a lot of you, you've been working toward your relationship with the Lord for many, many years. You should be commended and, um, and encouraged and uh, everything for, for doing that. Um, but, uh, you know, our whole journey toward holiness, that's what, it's, that's what it's all about. You know, Easter has just passed a couple of uh, weeks ago. And I think of how um, the stone was rolled away from the, from the tomb. And, uh, you know, that stone was not rolled away. The angel didn't roll that stone away so Jesus could get out of the tomb. It was so that we could see that our Lord and Savior is alive and that he's risen and that he is Lord of all. He's conquered death. He's conquered the, dra the grave. And, uh, um, and so he wants us to come and see that. He wants us to be able to uh, come to him and to be able to uh, approach him. And he wants to be able to transform him and transform us and you know, we can't really become more like him unless we become less like us. And I don't mean um, less like, you know, give up your whole personality and become some kind of robot or something. We all have our own sense of humor and we all have our own personalities and things like that. But I'm talking about giving up our own selfish desires um, and that our, that our desires are uh, a little bit more aligned with his desires. You know, the thing I find so fascinating about this whole thing is that God knew everything about us before we were even in our mother's womb. He created us. He knows everything about us. And like your most intimate thoughts, your most hidden things, whatever, he knows it all. And he knows he's got your whole um, race, life planned out from the beginning. And so here's God He's, he's done this, and our race, our life is going to go toward godliness, holiness, toward Christ and Christ-likeness. So here's our starting point. Here's our finishing point. And then he gives us a, his Holy Spirit to go with us through the whole thing. It really wouldn't make any sense to me that when you think that you're going to go through your life like this, that it's like, well, Lord, you know, I know that you laid out all that for me and that you know all that, but I think I'm just going to kind of wing it on my own. You know, it doesn't really make any sense except for to be able to go through the whole thing. You know, if uh, Nancy and I are traveling or, or whatever and uh, we find out that somebody's been someplace that we want to go, we want to pick their brain, we want to find out all about where did you stay, what shouldn't we miss? All that kind of stuff. This is the same kind of thing. You just want to, you just want to go with the whole, with the Lord the whole way. Um, so, I heard an interesting analogy a little while ago, um, and uh, um, it's a little boy, and uh, he says to his dad, "How big is God?" 
And his dad says, well, he says, you see that, see that jet plane way up there, way up where the little white, see way up there? He says, how, how big does that airplane look to you? And the little boy says, well, it's not very big. And then the dad takes the son to the airport and he looks at this great big jumbo jet and he says, well, how big does that airplane look now? And he says, dad, that's huge. And then the dad says, well, that's the way God is. When he, when he is close to you, he's huge. He can have a great impact on your life and you can depend on him and everything because he has so much power in your life. But he says, but when God is way up there, far away, he can have very little impact on your life. It's like, almost like he doesn't even exist. So if you feel like you've been living a life holding Jesus at a distance, not really making a very big commitment to him, possibly even keeping him out of your life completely, I don't know. Um, you know, I would encourage each of us to look inside ourselves honestly, you know, to, to be able to assess where you are with the Lord. Are you far away? Are you keeping him far away? Are you keeping him at a distance? You only want to give him a piece of yourself or, you know, you don't really want to give up everything yet. You know, I've been there. We've all been there. So maybe we're all still there. I don't know. But I'm just saying, you know, this is, this is our race. This is what we want to accomplish. And, uh, you know, in the world, one of man's greatest pursuits is to uh, finding who we are. What's our identity? Why, what's our purpose on life? What, what defines us? And the world says that we want to have our validation through things like our accomplishments and successes and, you know, um, all of that kind of stuff. But all of that can be very fleeting satisfaction. Um, if we can have on the screen uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, uh, it says that for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus took the weight of all sin, absorbing its penalty without ever sinning himself. He did this so that we, you and I, can be reconciled to God with a new identity defined by Christ's righteousness. He's sacrificially given each of us a new identity for all of us who believe. So, we don't need to be seeking validation from the world, um, but resting in the realization of who we are in Christ and that he loved us to the point of dying for us. He doesn't put anything in front of us that we can't accomplish without him in our pursuit of him. And, uh, and so when he's for us, you know, who can be against us? We're running our own personal race with God in us and through us and by our side and we don't need to uh worry about any of that kind of stuff i found out that uh the greek word also through a commentary is what we get our english word agony from i don't want to pronounce the greek word <laughs> i don't know greek i don't pretend to know greek but i'm just saying if we get our word agony from race um then that would indicate to me that our race, our lifelong thing is not going to be without any kind of failures or setbacks or obstacles or anything like that. When we go through life with the Lord by our side, um, it's I'm not promising a trouble-free life. Um, it, it'll be challenging and as, as a matter of fact, we won't really even be able to do it without God. And the fact is that if it was not a race, then why would there be a challenge? Like, there is a challenge involved. In, um, in Galatians 2 and 20, that will also be up there. Um, it says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, to be crucified with Christ is saying that not I live, but Christ in me. It sounds so radical because the exact opposite 
of what the world teaches us. What I'm, what I'm saying to you is that we need to have Jesus as our Lord and Master, not only our Savior. You know, we're running a race of surrender, surrendering ourselves to Christ. And so, um, you know, it, it almost doesn't make sense that you are running a race of surrender. Aren't you supposed to run a race of victory? But in God's upside down world, surrender is your victory. Romans 5 says that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. So expect failures and hardships um, and, uh, and treat it like a race and a competition against ourselves and against the evil desires of the world and, and our own flesh. Um, and I just encourage you to step up to the challenge that is ahead of you um, with Christ at your side and indwelling you. You know... Um, when we think about endurance and you think about your life, just enduring life is not very exciting. Persevering is like enduring, but perseverance is more of an action or emotion. Perseverance is taking on obstacles and overcoming them. It's not just enduring them. You're persevering over them. And I encourage you with those words is that to persevere, to attack your life with determination to become more Christ-like and not wait for it to just suddenly um, overtake you. Um, if we can uh, put the, the Hebrews uh, uh, verses back up on the screen, Peter, and, and if we could just leave it up there for now and... Uh, because um, I'm just going to kind of a little bit of a recap, but go through that in a sense. The, the, um, the therefore uh, is just relating back to chapter 11 of Hebrews. And a lot of um, commentators call that the Hall of Fame chapter or um, the who's who of the Bible. Um, because it's got um, all of the... When, most of, anyway, the, the greatest um, examples uh, or, or uh, people of the Bible of, of uh, you know, say like Moses and, you know, whatever. They're just all of our big heroes of the Bible who, you know, were uh, empowered by God and they did great things for God and um, all of that kind of stuff. And these are the great cloud of witnesses. They're the, the ones that we can look to as an example. Um, one of the commentators was uh, talking about picturing them in heaven, looking down on us so that when we have our little victories of, you know, doing the right thing or overcoming sin or whatever, that they're kind of nodding in approval and maybe even clapping for us and that. And maybe we can picture that, but I can guarantee you that if they're in glory, there's no sadness there. So they're not looking at us. They're looking at the Lord and they're up there where we will be someday. But, uh, um, but you know, it's, it's just that they are such a great example for us that we can look to for encouragement as we, like, because if they can do it, we can do it, right? And um, the next thing that we see in this passage is that we're to throw off everything that hinders. Like in the case of an athlete, you wouldn't see somebody in swimming competition wearing their boots, for example. You know, anything at all that is going to be holding an athlete back, they do not want to be encumbered by. Um, so in your own life, what holds you back? You know, is, there, is your life so busy, for example, that you don't have time for God? Or, or uh, are you like easily distracted? Um, maybe such a great procrastinator that you continually to put other things ahead of your pursuit of him, making virtually everything else more important than things like reading his word or praying or worshiping him. Um, a full of fear and worry that, you know, you're not going to do a good job, you know, or that you're, you know, that you, you can't do that. But, you know, Christ is in you. The power of God is in you. So even though you think you can't do it, well, you can't do it, but he can do it. 
John even said that earlier this morning of how, you know, it's, it's, it's him. He can't do it without. And, and uh, you know, the thing is that if you let those things stand in your way, that all those things come from Satan. If you let all those things stand in your way, he, Satan wins. God doesn't win. That's not moving toward holiness. It's moving the other way. It's letting, it's letting the enemy defeat you. We can persevere over that through the power of God. Um, turn to Jesus. Let him fight those battles for you. Um, and also, as we move along here, the sin that so easily entangles. <coughs> Excuse me. I would think that for most of us, that sin would be pride. You know, pride is the most often thing that um, causes us to develop wrong attitudes toward others, um, doing things for the wrong reasons. Uh, you might develop self-righteous attitudes, passing judgment on others when you don't even have any idea what's happening in their life um, or what they might be going through. Um, you know, speaking of pride, I've even known people that were proud of their own humbleness. Sounds kind of funny, but it's true. And uh, um, so we need to guard our hearts against those kinds of forces. We need to be aware of our own human weaknesses. And pride can often be the most difficult thing to see in ourselves. It's often a lot easier to see in others. Um, and the only way that we can do that is fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the only perfect sinless one, the Son of God, who indwells each one of us who believe. And he will guide and direct each of us through this maze of life. It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. You know, Jesus was not joyful about facing a brutal death on a brutal cross. That's not, he was not joyful about that, but he was joyful of running his race. He was joyful of um, accomplishing his purpose. He was joyful about sacrificing himself for our salvation because of his love for us. He more than anyone knows what it is to run a race set before him. He more than anyone knows how to keep his eyes set on things above and how to be one with God. When we fix our eyes on him and when we draw close to him and when we depend on him and trust him and love him and seek him and submit to him and when we make him our master that's what we need to set like that that that's what um make him our master and to to be able to move toward him have uh to become more christ-like and not to lose not to lose heart or to grow weary um, you know, when we get to glory and we see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, will he say to you, well done, good and faithful servant? You've run a great race. Welcome home. I pray that that would be true for each and every one of us. Um, I'm going to invite the uh, verse team to come back up. They're going to close uh, service with uh, some music, and I'll just uh, say a quick prayer while they're coming up. Lord, I just uh, pray that this message this morning, that, um, that Lord, you would just grant the increase to it, that um, each seed that you would have uh, put in our heart, Lord, that you would uh, water that and, uh, and help each of us to uh, continue to grow closer and closer to you. And, um, and we thank you for who you are in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Doug. That was uh, a great message. Um, so today, the band has been practicing uh, a couple songs for like six months. <laughs> it's been a little, little while. Um, so we're going to do those today. Uh, we're going to introduce them to the congregation. Once I get my microphone set the way it was, sorry. 
Um, so the first song is called uh, 